Hi guys, welcome back to Mars Reading. Today we will be continuing How the World is Passed by Clint Smith and we will be diving into the Monticello Plantation portion slash chapter in this book. So let's go ahead and dive right into it. There's a difference between history and nostalgia. Monticello Plantation. Heading out from my home in Washington, D.C. in the morning, I drove against traffic, moving from the new condos of an increasingly gentrifying D.C. through the single-family home suburban landscape of Northern Virginia and into the vast green expanse surrounding I-95 South. As I drove to Monticello, I observed how Virginia is largely a tale of two states, Northern Virginia, those incorporated municipalities that serve as suburbs to the District of Columbia has always felt somewhat distant from the South in the ways I grew up understanding it. But beyond the suburbs, once I started driving past the diners and gas stations, the Dixie flags hanging in their windows, I was reminded that this state was once the bastion of the Confederacy. As, as I made my way down the highway, finding myself on cruise control both in the car and in my mind, I saw a sign in my peripheral vision indicating the entrance to a plantation. Assuming it to be Monticello, I put my blinker on and began to turn, only to jerk the car back onto the highway when I realized this was not Thomas Jefferson's plantation, but that of James Madison, Jefferson's dear friend, confidant, fellow Virginian, and successor to his presidency. Madison's Montpelier Plantation, less than 30 miles northeast of Jefferson's, is almost a prelude to Monticello, not simply as a result of their relative proximity, but because the two men share similarly contradictory relationships to the aspirational documents they ushered into existence while enslaved people worked on their plantations. The Madison family held more than 300 enslaved people over the course of their time on the property. Both of the men inscribed words that promoted equality and freedom in the founding documents of the United States while owning other human beings. Both men built a nation while making possible the plunder of millions of people. What they gave our country and all they stole from it must be understood together. I did not turn into Mont I did not turn into Montpelier, but there was something about driving past it on the way to Monticello that reminded me that Jefferson was not singular in his moral inconsistencies. Rather, he was one of the founding fathers who fought for their own freedom while keeping their boots on the necks of hundreds of others. Within a few miles of Monticello, the highway transitions into a one-way road lined with white pines and hamlocks. I pulled into the dirt parking lot and made my way up the concrete stairs to see if tour tickets were still available. One of the first things I noticed about Monticello was how the vast majority of its visitors seemed to be white. It's not so much unexpected as it is markedly conspi conspicuous to see a plantation that, had, that, that has had its ratios reversed. There were a few tourist groups from different Asian countries, but they were the small exception. 200 years ago, Monticello, like most plantations, was populated largely by the enslaved descendants of Africans, while white laborers and Jefferson's family were a much smaller proportion of its inhabitants. At any given time in Monticello, there was approximately 130 enslaved people, far outnumbering Jefferson, his family, and the paid white workers. I walked toward the stately mansion, which sat just a couple hundred feet ahead of me. Waves of heat rose from the dirt path, and mulberry trees spread themselves out across the land, creating intermittent pockets of cool respite for visitors. Underneath, a lush sugar maple on one side of the house was a group of about a dozen people, all sharing what city they had come from. The group ranged in age and geography, spanning generations and state borders. And what about you, sir? The guide said as I scurried under the tree where the rest of the group was standing. I had chosen the tour that began 10 minutes after I arrived, one that focused specifically on Jefferson's relationship to slavery. From DC, I said. Right down the road, he responded, nodding his head and giving a smile that was as courteous as it was practiced. 
Before I was able to gather myself and bring my full attention to the group, I was struck by what lay behind us in the distance. The entire plantation sat at the top of a mountain ringed by a thick cascade of sundry trees so tightly packed together that I could not tell where one began and the next ended. Behind the first string of trees were rolling hills that went off in every direction as a silhouette of outlying mountains kissed the clouds resting over their peaks. David Thorson, our guide, wore a blue and white stripped ox, sorry, striped Oxford shirt, short sleeved but a size too big, leaving his sleeves fluttering along his elbows when a light mountain breeze passed by. His crispy iron khaki pants set high on his waist, impressive creases moving down the front of his pant legs from his belt buckle to his shoes. David's peach face reddened from all the hours spent standing in the sun, was clean shaven and sunk gently into itself around his cheeks. Ridges and wrinkles made their way down his jawbone and onto his neck. He wore large, thick, rimmed glasses and a brown wide brimmed hat that cast a slight shadow over his eyes. He spoke with a calm even handedness that invited people into discussion like a professor. I found out later that prior to becoming a tour guide in Mo at Monticello, David served for more than 30 years in the U.S. Navy. He had no experience as a teacher and no exposure to anything resembling museum studies before taking his job as a guide. Both of his children had enrolled in the University of Virginia, and he and his wife had fallen in love with Charlottesville during their frequent visits over the years. They loved it so much that they decided to relocate after David retired from the military, even though his children had graduated from the university long before. I didn't want to sit around talking back to the TV set, he would tell me. It gets you out where you are interacting with the public, with a broad international audience of people who have an interest in American history, an interest in Thomas Jefferson. So I was interested in sharing the story because I really do believe that you can't understand the United States without going back and understanding Jefferson. While the shadow over David's eyes gave him a sense of mystery, when he began speaking to the tour group, there was nothing enigmatic, enigmatic but what he was saying. Slavery is an institution. In Jefferson's lifetime, it become a system. Sorry, in Jefferson's lifetime, it becomes a system. So what is a slave system? It is a system of exploitation, a system of inequality and exclusion, a system where people are owned as property and held down by physical and psychological force, a system being justified even by people who know slavery is morally wrong. By doing what? Denying the very humanity of those who are enslaved solely on the basis of the color of their skin. People in the group began to murmur to one another, some with their hands over their mouths. In just a few sentences, David had captured the essence of chattel slavery in a way that few of my own teachers ever had. It's not that this information was new. It's that I had not expected to hear it in this place, in this way, with this group of almost exclusively white visitors staring back at him. David paused and then said, there's a struggle going on here, he continued, discussing how Jefferson's relationship to slavery was in plain sight because Jefferson maintained extensive records, the best known of which is his farm book. In these documents, he kept track of the name, birth date, location, and sale each person he held in bondage. He also kept track of the rations of the rations distributed to the enslaved. A typical week's worth of rations, said David, included a peck of cornmeal, half a pound of meat, usually pork, occasionally half a dozen salted fish. David discussed how Jefferson's records showed who was bought and sold over the course of decades. Jefferson sold, leased, and mortgaged enslaved people, often in an effort to pay off debts he owed, as well as to preserve his standard of living. The people Jefferson sold while he was alive were mostly from Poplar Forest, his plantation in Bedford County, but also from Monticello in a smaller plantation in Goochland County called El Elk Hill. Having enslaved workers, David explained, helped Jefferson maintain his lifestyle 
by giving him the time and space to do what he cared about most, reading, writing, and hosting guests who came to visit. Jefferson also gave presents to his kids and grandkids, he said in a pivot, a moment of res respite for those who within just a few minutes had begun to see their prior conceptions of Jefferson evaporate away. I felt disappointed, wanting David to continue exposing the parts of Jefferson's legacy that so frequently remained buried. This was the purpose of the tour, I thought, to, ex to excavate unsavory stories and wrestle with them, outwardly, honestly, without pause. But as soon as the thought came, David began the second half of his statement. Those presents were human beings among the enslaved community. David knew what he was doing. The pedagogical equivalent of a crossover in basketball, lulling your opponent in one direction, inducing them into a momentary assurance that they know in which direction things are moving, before promptly switching hands right underneath their outstretched arms, leaving them frozen in place behind you as you drive to the basket. David continued to refer to the enslaved people to the enslaved black people living on Monticello as human beings. The decision to use human as the primary descriptor rather than slave was a small yet intentional move. He described the games the children played on warm Sunday afternoons, the only day of the week they did not have to work. The songs enslaved workers sang late into the evenings, the celebrations they took part in when someone was married, what reverberated through the what, rever sorry. what reverberated throughout was the humanity of the enslaved people, their unceasing desire to live a full life, one that would not be defined simply by their forced labor. David and every other tour guide in that plantation had to convey the sense of personhood with limited access to stories of the enslaved themselves. Historian Lucia Stanton, who worked as a historian at Monticello, for over three decades has wrestled with this. To reconstruct the world of Monticello's African Americans is a challenging tax, task. Only six images of men and women who lived there in slavery are known, and their own words are preserved in just four reminisc reminiscences and a handful of letters, she wrote. Without the direct testimony of mostly of the African American residents of Monticello, we must try to hear their voices in the sparse records of Jefferson's farm book and the often biased accounts and letters dealing with labor management and throughout the inherited memories of those who left Monticello for lives of freedom. Even with limited resources, David brought these stories to life. He finished his preamble to the tour. You know, if you take it all together, those documents, like Jefferson's farm book, the memories from people who call Monticello home, and then the archaeology, the story does begin to unfold. Despite the horror and oppression of slavery, those families who once lived here, what are they doing? They're trying to carve out some kind of a normal life. They are passing on tradition. They are giving their kids a chance to learn and a chance to play. Maybe they're even trying to shield those children from the reality. I looked around the lawn and imagined what Monticello would have been like two centuries ago. It belonged to Jefferson, yes, but it was not his home alone. It was the home of hundreds of enslaved people, including several large families. Some families were enslaved at Monticello for three generations or more. They were the Gilletti, the Gillettes, the Hearns, the Fawcett's, the Grangers, the Hubbards, and the Hemmingses. So sorry for mispronouncing any names. That is not my intention at all. I scanned the landscape and imagined the Gillette children running between horses as the animals were groomed and fed, their adolescent voices swirling in the mountain air. I thought of David and Isabel Hearn, how, despite marriage between enslaved people being illegal in Virginia, they were wed and remained so until Isabel's death. I imagined how they might have taken breaks from work under the shade of mulberry trees, whispering and laughing and holding each other in their arms. I thought of Joseph Fawcett, who remained in Monticello while his wife was taken to Washington, D.C. to train as a cook in the White House kitchen during Jefferson's presidency, how three of their children were born in the White House, how in 1806 Jefferson thought Joseph had run away when he had in fact gone to see his wife in Washington. I thought too of how in 1827, after Jefferson's death, Edward and Jane Gillette, along 
with nine of their children and twelve of their grandchildren were sold. How David Hearn, Hearn, along with his thirty-four surviving children and grandchildren, were sold. How Joseph Fawcett was freed in Jefferson's will, but his wife Edith and seven of their children were sold. How these families were separated to posthumously pay off Jefferson's debts. I thought of all the love that had been present in this plantation, and I thought too of all the pain. David waved his hand for us to follow him, and we walked from the area adjacent to Jefferson's home down Mulberry Row, where some of the enslaved families had lived. David found a cluster of benches under a, gro under a grove of mulberry trees and motioned for us to all to take a seat. As he positioned himself between us and the garden behind him, he told the story of an enslaved worker named Carrie, a teenage Kari? Sorry, a teenage boy who was part of the plantation's nail-making operation. The enslaved adolescent boys were directed to make close to 1,000 nails a day, and they could be beaten if they fell too far behind. One day, Kari's friend, Brown Colbert, hid one of Kari's tools as a joke. I'm sorry, I don't know if it's Kari or Carrie. Carrie knew there was nothing funny about not being able to find his tools. Carrie became so angry, an anger likely stemming from a profound sense of fear, that he hit his friend over the head with a hammer, temporarily putting him in a coma. Although Brown Colbert recovered, Jefferson found himself in a difficult position. What was Jefferson to do with someone who had almost killed another member of the Monticello community? Should he be whipped? What did the community of other enslaved people want? What would Brown's family want? What were the implications of letting Carrie stay? What were the implications of sending him away? Ultimately, Jefferson gave orders to sell Carrie, as David put it, to a place so far away it will never be heard from again, so that it will appear to the other nail makers as though he had been put away by death. Soon after, slave traders came to Monticello and paid $300 for Carrie. No one at Monticello would ever see or hear from him again. While largely the same families remained on the Monticello plantation throughout their lives, Carrie's story made me think of the larger practice of family separation during slavery. Beyond Monticello, the splitting of families was not peripheral to the practice of slavery, it was central. In Soul by Soul, historian Walter Johnson writes, of the two-thirds of a million interstate sales made by the traders in the decades between the city war, 25% involved the destruction of a first marriage and 50% destroyed a nuclear family, many of these separating children under the age of 13 from their parents. Nearly all of them involved the disillusion of a previously existing community, and those are only the interstate sales. Historian Edward Bone Kemper estimates that over the course of chattel slavery's existence, about one million enslaved people were separated from their families. Scenes and descriptions of family separation are central to the are central to the narratives enslaved people wrote and published throughout the 18th and 19th centuries. One of the most harrowing comes from a man named Henry Bibb. In his narrative of the life and adventures of Harry of Henry Bibb an American slave written by himself, which was published in 1849, four years after the publication of Frederick Douglass's book with a similar title, Bibb escaped slavery in Kentucky and fled to Canada, where he became a well-known abolitionist, starting a newspaper called Voice of the Fugitive. In his book, there is an astonishing illustration of a man in a suit sitting atop a table in the middle of a room, looking down at the people beneath him. In his left hand is a gavel, his fingers wrapped around its neck, and in his right hand is a black infant, the small child dangling by the by the wrist. A woman who looks to be the who looks to be the child's mother is beneath the man on her knees, arms outstretched in desperation, pleading for mercy from men who have sought to render themselves gods. There are several other white men in the frame, all wearing suits and brimmed hats. The one to whom the mother seems to be, to be directing her pleas stands to the left of the table with what looks like a cigarette between his lips. Another at the edge of the frame holds a whip above his, be, above his head, its lash cracking in the air. Along the lower half of the frame are the enslaved. Some of them are in chains and two of them are holding each other. One has his head buried in his hands. Next to the illustration, Bib writes in devastating detail. After the men were all sold, they then sold the women and children. 
they offered the first woman to lay down her child and mount the auction block. She refused to give up her little one, and clung to it as long as she could, while the cruel lash was, a, was applied to her back for disobedience. She pleaded for mercy in the name of God, but the child was torn from the arms of its mother amid the most heart-rending shrieks from the mother and child on the one hand, and bitter oaths and cruel lashes from the tyrants on the other. Finally, the poor little child was torn from the mother while she was sacrificed to the highest bidder. In this way, the sale was carried on from beginning to end. There was each speculator with his handcuffs to bind his victims after the sale. And while they were doing their writings, the Christian portion of the slaves asked permission to kneel in prayer on the ground before they separated, which was granted. And while bathing each other with tears of sorrow on the verge of their final separation, their eloquent appeals and prayer to the Most High seemed to cause an unpleasant sensation upon the ears of their tyrants, who ordered them to rise and make ready their limbs for the cavils. And as they happened not to bound at the first sound, they were soon raised from their knees by the sound of the lash and the rattle of the chains in which each in which they were soon taken off by their respective masters, husbands from wives and children from parents, never expecting to meet until the judgment of the great day. Though Jefferson was acutely aware of the impact that selling an enslaved person to another plantation could have on the rest of the enslaved population, he still sold more than 100 over the course of his life. Lucia Stanton writes that Jefferson, like other antebellum Virginians who considered themselves enlightened preferred that his enslaved property be sold in family units. Typically, he only sold individuals when he was hard pressed financially. In 1820, he wrote that he had scruples about selling Negroes, but for delinquency or on their own request. And it is true that there were occasions in which Jefferson would sell or buy an enslaved person to reunite them with the spouse where it can be done reasonably. According to Jefferson, he wanted a scenario in which neither husbands and wives nor children and parents would be split apart. But Jefferson did allow families to be separated under his watch. He separated children as young as 13 from their parents by sale, bought children as young as 11, and separated children under 10 from their families by transferring them between his own properties or giving them to family members as gifts. Jefferson believed himself to be a benevolent slave owner, but his moral ideals came second to, and were always entangled with, his own economic interests and the interests of his family. Jefferson understood as well the particular economic benefits of keeping husbands and wives together noting that a child raised every two years is of more profit than the crop of the best laboring man. Jefferson believed that he might absolve himself of some other barbarism of slavery by reducing the extent to which he employed its most brutal tactics. The whippings of his slaves, for example, must not be resorted to but in extremities. He wanted the best of both worlds looking for overseers who might be less brutal than was typical for late 18th century Virginia and who could do so without compromising the yield and efficiency of the plantation. When Robert Hemings, the mixed race enslaved workman, who was the child of Elizabeth Hemings and Jefferson's father-in-law, John Wallace, found a wife and requested to buy his freedom, Jefferson grew angry because he expected loyalty for the indulgences he had granted Hemings, and could not understand that a slave might choose freedom and family over fidelity to the master. But absolution, in Jefferson's case, could never be attained by simply refusing to participate in the most heinous aspects of slavery. To own an enslaved person was to perpetuate the bar barbarism. Oops, I think earlier I pronounced it wrong, but the barbarism of the institution, and when he felt it necessary to maintain the order that made his life possible, Jefferson engaged in some of the very practices he claimed to so deeply abhor. Around 1810, James Hubbard, an enslaved man who worked in Monticello's nail factory, ran away. 
He had done so once before, about five years prior, and was caught shortly after his escape. This time he was caught about a year later. When Hubbard was returned, Jefferson wrote, I had him severely flogged in the presence of his old companions. Although he attempted to create distance between himself and the abuse by assigning the task to an overseer, Jefferson knew, just as slaveholders throughout the South knew, that the spectacle of public assault was a means of both asserting authority over and maintaining order among enslaved workers. Over the course of David's hour-long tour, I found myself watching two women in particular. Each time he presented a new story, fact, or a piece of historical evidence about Jefferson as an enslaver, their faces would, would contort in astonishment, their mouths would sit agape, and they would shake their heads, almost as if they were being told on authority that the earth was flat after all. After David completed his tour, and people dispersed to visit the rest of the plantation, I approached the two women and asked them if they were open to sharing their reactions to what they had just heard. Donna folded her brochure and used it to fan the back of her neck. Her silver hair took on a yellowish hue under the midsummer sun and was tied in a ponytail that fell past her shoulders. She rocked from side to side as we spoke, shifting her weight from one leg to the other, her black flip-flop squeaking softly under the changing pressure. Her voice was imbued with a gentle Texas lilt and stretched out her eyes and melted her elves into the breeze. Grace's voice, on the other hand, was higher and more hurried. Her short salt and pepper hair was only a few inches long and hugged her scalp. Her skin had become sun-blotched from years spent living in Florida, even though she told me she was originally from Vermont. Both were warm and welcoming when I approached them, as a cool wind passed and gave us a moment of relief from the summer heat. I asked them if, before coming on this tour, they had been aware of Jefferson's relationship to slavery, how he had flogged his enslaved workers, how he had separated loved ones, how he had kept generations of families in bondage. Their answers were swift and sincere. No, no. They both shook their heads, as if still perplexed by what they had just learned. There was a discernible sense of disappointment, perhaps in themselves, perhaps in Jefferson, perhaps in both. You grow up in its basic American history from fourth grade, He's a great man, and he did all this, Donna said, gesticulating with her hands and almost retroactively mocking the things she had previously been taught about Jefferson. And granted, he achieved things, but we were just saying this really took the shine off the guy. Yes, that, that's a good word, said Grace, nodding her head. Grace had been married to Donna's brother before he passed away. They were already close, but since his passing, they had found comfort in each other's companionship traveling together different places across the country, particularly sites of historical significance. They explained that they had been drawn to Monticello, Monticello because they were fascinated, fascinated by architecture that was created without, without the aid of modern-day tools and machinery. Donna, in particular, admired the artisans who constructed such intimately detailed designs on structures that were still standing today. I'm kind of a history nut, she said, and I just wanted to see the house because I love going to towns, because they built things back in a time without all the fancy tools. Jefferson's house, which took more than 40 years to complete, was the embodiment of so much of what they admired. Historian Annette Gordon-Reed has written of how, has written of how before the home could even be built, enslaved workers had to shave off the top of the mountain in the dead of winter at a time when there was no mecha mechanical technology to assist them beyond a shovel in their hands. Additionally, because there was no available water supply at the peak of the mountain, enslaved workers had to dig 65 feet into the earth, twice as deep as was typically required, over the course of 46 days before they found water. The home itself is an 11,000 square foot, 43 room manor. Its iconic west front has four Doric style columns, constructed using more than 4,000 curved bricks that were then plastered to resemble stone. The columns support a roof that extends from the front of the house, forming a portico, 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 I'm sorry, where Jefferson would sit and entertain his guests, statesmen, 
philosophers, tradesmen, and old friends. Hundreds of thousands of cinnamon red bricks provide texture to the home's facade, with green shutters hugging white framed windows that glittered in the sunlight. Much of the house's design was inspired by Jefferson's time in Europe and by ancient Roman and Renaissance architecture. He used both free white laborers and his own enslaved workers to move his vision toward reality. That's why I like to go to these, Donna said, again referring to the impressive aesthetics of the house. Jefferson was just a sideline, but boy, this, this? She was looking down, shaking her head. This man here? Grace interjected, looking in the direction of David, who was chatting with two visitors who had lingered behind after the tour, just opened a whole new avenue to me. It just took his shine off, Donna repeated. He might have done great things, but boy, did he have a big flaw. What's fascinating about Jefferson is that this is a flaw of which he was wholly cognizant of. Is, I'm sorry. This is a flaw of which he was wholly, co wholly cognizant. In notes on the state of Virginia, he wrote, there must be doubtless be an unhappy influence on the manners of our people produced by the existence of slavery among us. The whole commerce between master and slave is a perpetual exercise of the most, of the most boisterous passions, the most unremitting despotism on the one part and degrading submissions on the other. Our children see this and learn, to in, and learn to imitate it, for man is an imitative animal. The parent storms, the child looks on, catches the lineaments of wrath, puts on the same airs in the circle of small slaves, gives a loose to his worst of passions, and thus, nursed, educated, and daily exercised in tyranny, cannot be stamped by it with odious pe peculiarities. The man must be a prodigy who can retain his manners and morals undepraved of such circumstances. Despite this apparent self-awareness, Jefferson considered his enslaved workers a valuable asset that might help reduce the debts that plagued him. The torment of mine I endure till the moment shall arrive when I shall not owe a shilling on earth is such really as to render life of little value, he wrote in a letter to a friend in July 1787. I cannot decide to sell my lands. I have sold too much of them already, and they are the only sure provision for my children, nor would I willingly sell the slaves, as long as there remains any prospect of paying my debts with their labor. Jefferson hoped to put his enslaved workers on an easier footing once his finances were stable, but he remained in debt for the rest of his life. Nearly all of his enslaved workers, about 200 people at the time, at Monticello and another property, were auctioned after his death in 1826 to pay his debts. Jefferson knew that slavery degraded the humanity of those who perpetuated its existence because it necessitated the subjugation of another human being. At the same time, he believed that black people were an inferior class. This is where Jefferson's logic falls apart. Historian Winthrop D. Jordan wrote in 1968, If Jefferson truly believed that black people were inferior, then he must have suspected that the creator might have in fact created man unequal. And he could not say this without giving his assertion exactly the same logical force as his famous statement to the contrary. Jefferson believed that it was impossible for blacks and whites to live peacefully alongside one another after the emancipation of the enslaved, stating in his 1821 autobiography, the two races, equally free, could not live in the same government. Nature, habit, opinion has drawn indelible lines of distinction between them. In a letter written to his friend Jared Sparks on February 4th, 1824, Jefferson reflected on the possibility of the e expatriation of black people through the establishment of a colony on the coast of Africa. But yet already discarded African colonization is unfeasible because of the expense. I do not say this to induce an inference that the getting rid of them is forever possible, for that is neither my opinion nor my hope. He wrote to Sparks, but only that it cannot be done in this way. There is, I think, a way in which it can be done, he continued, that is, by emancipating the afterborn, leaving them on due compensation with their mothers until their services are worth their maintenance, and then putting them 
to industrious occupations until a proper age for deportation. He had come to believe that the Caribbean was a promising destination. St. Domingo is become independent, and with a population of that color only, and if the public papers are to be credited, their chief offers to pay their passage, to receive them as free citizens, and to provide them employment. What Jefferson was promising was that the government purchase new-born slaves from their enslaver, have them stay with their mothers until they were ready to separate, and then send them off to Santo Domingo, modern-day Haiti. He expressed similar views in an 1814 letter to Edward Coles, then James Madison's private secretary, and a man who would go on to become the second governor of Illinois. I've seen no proposition so expedient, Jefferson wrote, is that of emancipation of those slaves born after a given day, and of their education and expatriation at a proper age. In 1807, during the second term of his presidency, Jefferson signed an act prohibiting the importation of slaves to the United States. If Jefferson believed slavery would slowly die out after the transatlantic slave trade was abolished. However, it was a hypothesis that ran counter to the evidence available on his own farm. Per his farm book, there were at least 22 births and 12 deaths among his enslaved population between 1774 and 1778. According to the scholar Michael Tadman, among North American slaves, births greatly exceeded deaths so that the slave population expanded rapidly. Indeed, the North American pattern was probably with a few locals and sometimes short-term exceptions unique in the history of slavery. As historian C. Van Woodward wrote, so far as history reveals, no other slave society, whether of antiquity, anti antiquity or modern times, has so much as sustained, much less greatly multiplied, its slave population by relying on natural increase. After the invention of the cotton gin in 1793, the cotton industry exploded, and with it the need for slave labor. According to the National Archives, the yield of raw cotton doubled every decade following 1800. In 1790, there were eight slave states, and in 1860, there were 15. Jefferson saw the beginning of this expansion, but he would not live to see how all-encompassing the peculiar institution became. By 1816, sorry, by 1860, about one in three Southerners was an enslaved person. As much as he said he detested slavery, Jefferson did not spend a large portion of his life attempting to limit it in the United States. His original ordinance of 1784 would have barred slavery in the Northwestern Territories after 1800, although it would have allowed enslavement during a 16-year grace period in between. But that proposal was rejected. Afterward, Jefferson largely left the issue of the domestic abolition of slavery untouched beyond private conversations and correspondence. Jefferson, it seems, was above all a statesman and a power recognition of how increasingly steadfast opposition to any semblance of abolition was in Virginia and throughout the South, he largely backed away from public admonishment of the system. Privately, he both condemned slavery and expressed ambivalence about freeing enslaved people. To give liberty, he wrote in a letter in 1789, or rather, to abandon persons whose habits have been formed in slavery is like abandoning children. Gordon Reed notes that in the letter, sorry, that in the latter half of his life, Jefferson resigned himself to the fact that slavery would not be abolished in his lifetime, and certainly not through any endeavor led by him. He believed that the project of emancipation would be carried out by another generation, and that he and his revolutionary colleagues had done their part by emancipating the colonies from Great Britain and creating the world's first constitutional republic, a place where these questions would even be able to be grappled with in the first place. The sun, now, was hidden behind a thin layer of clouds that temporarily eased the heat on our necks. 
I asked both Donna and Grace what they had previously been taught about all of this. You know, we studied Jefferson, Grace said. The slavery part was not part of it. Well, it wasn't detailed, Donna shared. It didn't put any heart and thought into it. In high school and college, you didn't think, these are families, these are moms and dads being separated from each other. So that wasn't part of the education. David had spent time in the early part of our tour talking about how the children on the plantation made marbles out of the clay from the road, playing with one another under the shadow of their shacks as the sun set each evening. He had talked about how the enslaved celebrated weddings, birthdays, and funerals, how they used writing letters, sorry, how they used writing slates they hid from overseers in order to learn how to read and write. Donna and Grace had so many people, specifically white people, often have understood slavery and those held in its grip only in abstract terms. They do not see the faces, they cannot picture the hands, they do not hear the fear or the laughter, they do not consider that these were children like their own, or that these were people who had birthdays and weddings and funerals, who loved and celebrated one another just as they loved and celebrated their loved ones. Donna seemed particularly appalled by how the institution of slavery had affected the children. I mean, splitting families, she said. Oh my God, how can they split a family? It's happening now, said Grace. As the three of us held our conversation in July 2018, the Trump administration had already separated roughly 3,000 children from their parents at the southern border of the United States, invoking the outrage of millions in the U.S. and abroad. We had heard about mothers and fathers being told that their children were simply going to be given showers only to have them learn after hours had passed that their children had been taken somewhere else, some place they did not know. These two women, self-proclaimed Southern Republicans, found themselves identifying the parallels between families separated during slavery and those separated while seeking asylum in the United States from violence in Central America. Donna came from a family in which she said her mother had extreme views. When I asked her what she meant by extreme, Donna described her mother's stance using a phrase that was not uncommon in the discourse of many Southerners. The only good one is a dead one. The one here is, of course, a genteel manum. It was a phrase I had heard from my grandparents as they spoke of the way white people had talked to them. Growing up in the mid-20th century, Jim Crow South, where the law did not protect you from the terror of white supremacy, but instead abetted it. The uncensored version of the phrase goes, the only good n-word is a dead n-word. Here I was on a plantation that enslaved hundreds of people who had skin like mine, having a conversation with a white conservative, Fox News consuming woman from Texas whose mother had conveyed to her throughout her life that people like me were, that perhaps I was, better off dead than alive. A woman with whom, surprisingly even to me, I was sharing photos of my 14-month-old son. We spoke for a few more minutes, but soon felt the temperature of the air shift. We looked down and, small, and saw small droplets of rain begin to freckle the clay road. At one point, Grace, repeating for herself more than for anyone else, summed up what she, only an hour before, had never been forced to wrestle with. Here, he uses all of these people, and then he marries a lady, and then they have children, she said, letting out a heavy sigh. A reference to selling Hemings, an enslaved woman who bore at least six of Jefferson's children. The two were never married. Jefferson is not the man I thought he was. The truth is that it was not until much later in my life that I too realized Jefferson was not the man I had been taught he was. It wasn't until 2014, in my first year of graduate school, when I read notes on the state of Virginia that I was presented with a more complicated, or rather a more accurate version of Jefferson. I'd cautiously flipped toward the sections that specifically considered Jefferson's relationship to slavery and encountered a passage in which he theorized that black people Black people are inferior to the whites in the endowments both of body and mind. I had also read the passage where he had said 
of Phyllis Wheatley, widely understood to be the first published black woman poet in the history of the United States, that the compositions published under her name are below the dignity of criticism. Jefferson believed that, pe- that black people, as a rule, were not capable of poetic expression. Misery is often the parent of the most affecting touches in poetry, he wrote. Among the blacks is misery enough, God knows, but no poetry. Love is the peculiar estrum of the poet. Their love is ardent, but it kindles the senses only, not the imagination. At the time I encountered this passage, I was finishing what would be my first collection of poetry. I was writing in the aftermath of the Ferguson Uprising, using poetry to process the incessant state-sanctioned violence happening to black people all around me, attempting to put my life in conversation with the political moment in the history that birthed it. I spent hours poring over both the voice and the form of my poems, revising, rearranging, adding and deleting until there were dozens of iterations of every stanza, every line. I thought of how seriously I took the craft. I thought of how all my work, even in response to violence, stemmed from a place of love, a love of my community, a love of my family, a love of my partner, a love of those hoping to build a better world than the one we live in. When I read Jefferson's disparagement of Wheatley, it felt like he had been disparaging the entire lineage of black poets who would follow her, myself included, and I saw a man who had not had a clear understanding of what love is. When Robert Hayden gave us the ballads to remember how captured Africans survived the Middle Passage and arrived on these shores, it was an act of love. When Gwendolyn Brooks wrote about the children of the south side of Chicago playing with one another in neighborhoods left neglected by the city, it was an act of love. When Audrey Lord fractured this language and then built us a new one, giving us a fresh way to make sense of who we are in the world. It was an act of love. When Sonia Sanchez makes lightning of her tongue, moving from from southern colloquialisms to stanzas shaped by Swahili, traversing an ocean in one breath, it is an act of love. Jefferson's conceptions of love seem to have been so distorted by his own prejudices that he was unable to recognize the endless examples of love that pervaded plantations across the country. Mothers who huddled over their children and took the lash to their little ones wouldn't have to. Surrogate mothers, fathers, and grandparents who took in children and raised them as their own when their biological parents were disappeared in the middle of the night, the people who loved and married and committed to one another despite the omnipresent threat that they might be separated at any moment. What is love if not this? There is no story of Monticello, there is no story of Thomas Jefferson without understanding Sally Hemings. We have no letters or documentation written by Sally, birth name likely Sarah Hemings, and nothing written by Jefferson about her. There are no photographs of her. Almost all of what we know of her physical appearance comes from Isaac Jefferson, who was enslaved at Monticello at the same time as Hemings and described her as mighty near white. Sally was very handsome, long straight hair down her back. Other than that, all portraits that depict her likeness are rendered from the imagination of the artists. She She is a shadow without a body, a constellation for whom there are no stars, and yet the story of Sally Hemings sits at the center of Monticello. For two centuries, Jefferson scholars, as well as Jefferson's acknowledged descendants, rejected the idea, despite evidence to the contrary, that Jefferson had either romantic or a sexual relationship with Sally. They most certainly rejected the idea that he fathered all six of her children. Sally Hemings, Sally Hemings' mother, Elizabeth, was a mixed-race enslaved woman owned by Jefferson's father-in-law, John Wallace. Elizabeth, often called Betty, likely gave birth to six of Wallace's children while in bondage. Sally Hemings was the youngest. This meant that Sally and Jefferson's wife, Martha, were half-sisters. Before Martha passed away at age 33, she made Jefferson promise not to marry again. Jefferson, who deeply loved his wife, abided by that promise. This did not prevent him, however, from beginning a nearly four-decade sexual involvement with Sally, 
one that started when she was around 16, and Jefferson was in his mid-40s. Jefferson's relationship with Sally, to the extent that an association animated by ownership of one person over another can be classified as such, was seemingly an open secret during Jefferson's lifetime. In 1802, 1802 journalist James Callender wrote a series of salacious articles in the Richmond Recorder in which he claimed that Jefferson had fathered several illegitimate children by his slave concubine. It is well known that the man whom it delighted the people to honor keeps and for many years passes kept as his concubine, one of his own slaves. One story began, her name is Sally. Callender had not always been an antagonist of Jefferson. In fact, after Callender was fired from his job at the Philadelphia Gazette and found himself drowning in debt, Jefferson, aware of the political importance of having strong relationships with newspapers, assisted Callender in finding a new newspaper job and even paid him directly, off and on, for several years. After being imprisoned under the Alien and Sedition Acts for his anti-federalist writing, Callender returned to a world in which Jefferson was president of the United States. Callender, in light of his friend's newfound power, expected some expression of material gratitude for the years of pro-Jefferson writings. Callender wanted to be rich men postmaster. Jefferson did not appoint him to this position. In fact, he did not appoint Callender to any job. Callender, feeling particularly aggrieved, used his new position at the Richmond Recorder to circulate the Jefferson to circulate the Jefferson Hemming story, hoping to sabotage Jefferson's political career. Word spread as the story was reprinted in newspapers across the country. Jefferson never outwardly denied the allegation. He didn't have to. As Gordon Reed writes, most people either did not believe that Jefferson Hemming story or did not consider it significant enough to alter their vote for Jefferson's second term. Further, though it may have been taboo, it was not at all uncommon for white male enslavers to have sex with the black women enslaved on their plantations. Jefferson went on to win re-election. A new exhibit about Sally Hemings was one of the reasons I decided to visit Monticello. The exhibit promised to capture her story in its fullness and complexity. It is a story that Monticello had been figuring out how to tell for a long time, a story that perhaps took them too long to tell. A blade of light cut through the door frame of what may have been Hemings' living quarters, a small plaster-walled room with a red brick floor. Inside, a five-minute video played, telling the story of Sally Hemings and her involvement with Jefferson. The video was projected onto the wall, and Sally, because we don't know what she looked like, appears as a silhouette, first with a pregnant belly, then alongside silhouettes of her four children who survived into adulthood, adulthood, Beverly, Harriet, Madison, and Eston, three sons and one daughter. She is seen braiding her daughter's hair while the child's brothers practice violin, the instrument Jefferson played just a few feet away. The shadows of the children fade away, reappear, and then fade away again almost as if to resemble their, feel, their fleeting presence in the discourse around their father. On the projection, their names appear in Jefferson's farm book on a page entitled Roll of Negroes. Their cursive monikers easily lost amid the other names. He was not in the habit of showing par- partiality or fatherly affections to us children, said Jefferson's formerly enslaved son, Madison Hemings, to an interviewer in 1873. We were the only children of his by a slave woman. Jefferson's association with Hemings was not an aberration of the time, and it was also reflective of the insidious, tangled relationships between white men and enslaved women. In 18th century Virginia, white male enslavers had full dominion over their enslaved human beings and full sexual dominion over enslaved women. Their relationships were inherently corrupted by the power dynamics embedded within them. These women were in no position to refuse the advances of their owners or of any other white man who wanted them. There was no legal recourse, and both parties knew this. In fact, one of Jefferson's dear friends, John Hartwell Cock, wrote in his diary that it was not at all uncommon 
for bachelor and widowed, widowed slave owners to have an enslaved woman serve as a substitute for a wife. For Jefferson, after promising Martha that he would not marry again, being involved with an enslaved woman, like Sally, would have, in its own unsettling way, allowed him to keep his promise. I stepped out of the room after the short film was complete and began reading the signage on the outside walls of the living quarters. To my left was a woman with a badge that indicated she worked for Monticello. She looked in my direction, seeming to anticipate a question, so I asked her what had been on my mind since my conversation with Donna and Grace, whether she thought that people who visited this plantation, and more recently this exhibit, left thinking of Jefferson differently. I knew what Donna and Grace had experienced, but I wanted to know if that was somehow atypical. Teresa, a white woman with reddish blonde hair and soft eyes, stood adjacent to the Sally Hemings exhibit. She explained that she did think the majority of people left the plantation changed. She said that between the slavery tour and the new Sally Hemings exhibit, Monticello was pushing its visitors to see the more complex and holistic version of Jefferson. She did say, however, that some visitors thought the museum was trying to be too politically correct, and by portraying Jefferson more holistically, trying to change history. We're not changing history, Teresa said unfazed. We're telling history by telling the full story, more of the story of everyone who lived here, not just certain people who were able to tell their stories. She continued by saying that there were those who derided her and the rest of the staff at the plantation for trying to tear Jefferson down. But to me, I think they put him up on a pedestal and they deny the fact that he was human. He had things about his life that were flaws, and you've got to look at his life. From the moment he got up in the morning to the moment he went to bed at night, he's relying on slave labor for every aspect. Teresa's own journey to understand Jefferson in totality was also one that required unlearning, so much of what she had been taught. She had lived her entire life one county over from the grandeur of Jefferson's mountain top plantation, but when I asked her if she knew about Jefferson's relationship to slavery or to Hemings before she started working in Monticello, she responded, Oh gosh, no. She told me she had only seen it, she had known him only as the man who wrote the Declaration of Independence. For Teresa, her years of working in Monticello have been a journey of learning and unlearning. Being before given the tour in Monticello, guides go through weeks of training. There are also regular development sessions in which guides converse about what they've learned and share the questions Gus may have raised on their respective tours. Training gives staff the tools to deal with people like Donna and Grace, who, while shocked, accepted what they had heard, as well as those who might push back a little bit harder on what what they perceived to be an unwarranted tarnishing of Jefferson's legacy. The training has also helped Teresa put the history of Jefferson in conversation with what she sees happening in the broader landscape of U.S. politics. Those rallies they've been having in Charlottesville, she sighed, alluding to the white supremacist rallies that had taken place in the summer of 2017. We need to make sure we know our history. I don't know if I want to go so far as to embrace it, but learn from it. Behind Teresa was Mulberry Row, which served as the hub of a plantation. Workshops and homes had once lined the road, including several slave cabins. Today, there stood a single replica meant to serve as an example of the homes where people, where people enslaved at Monticello would live. The cabin sat away from main residence, but within its proximity, like a moon, still caught in the orbit of a planet, it could not escape. I stepped inside the cabin and stared at the cracked, uneven planks sliding the walls. I looked up at the roof and observed the whisper of sunlight squeezing through one small opening. Soft glimmers of sunlight, sorry, my bad. Soft beads of light rested on my shoulder. It was a crack that let in these glimmers of sunlight on clear days, but would just as easily admit streaks of rain on others. Even knowing this was just a replica of what the slave quarters looked like, I was overwhelmed by how little shelter this structure offered. I stood with three other people inside the space mirroring what someone once called a home, and felt the four of us tussle around one another in order to move about. The fabric of our clothes emitting static electricity, uh, sorry, emitting 
static electricity as we were up against one another. The cabin was a quarter the size of the entrance hall to Jefferson's mansion. I walked out of the cabin and into the afternoon light. As I stepped back onto the road, a white woman walked past with two small girls, I presumed were her daughters, their, bon their blonde and brunette ponytails bouncing against their backs of their respective necks as they trotted by. The mother looked at the cabin and said to the girls, how would you like that to be your home? The little girls didn't turn around before they started running away from the cabin, shouting, nah -uh, the red gravel spinning up into the air behind them. I left Monticello that day wanting to get a better sense of who David was and how he understood his role as a guide at Monticello. So a couple of months after my initial visit, I drove back down to Charlottesville to meet him and get one of the tours I had missed. One focused entirely on the Hemmings family. It had been raining for hours when I arrived. Undulations of rain and wind pulsed in the shadows of a gray afternoon. The plantation was far less crowded than it had been during my previous trip. Intermittent bodies carrying umbrellas splashed through the puddles that were sc scattered across the visitor center's courtyard. Before I met with David, I sat down with Brandon Dillard and Linnea Grimm. At the time of my visit, Brandon was the manager of special programs in the education and visitor programs department at Monticello. He is now the department's manager of historic interpretation. Linnea is the department's director. Brandon was wearing a checkered brown Oxford shirt with his sleeves rolled up to just below his elbows. His black hair was thin and receding to the top of his head. And he had a thick black goatee that swallowed his mouth except when he laughed, which he did often. He was in some ways an unlikely candidate for his position. He had been a philosophy major in college and worked as a bartender in Charlottesville for years after graduating. One day, he saw an ad in the local newspaper that Monticello was looking for tour guides. Eight years later, he was still here, having been promoted to his new position after years of leading tours. Linnea wore a black pantsuit, her brown hair cut just above her shoulders. She often paused for just a moment before speaking. The practice reflected a thoughtfulness that I, that I imagined had been cultivated from years of managing the public work of an institution grappling with its history to one of the most heinous periods in our nation's history. Brandon and Linnea had been at Monticello long enough to see the public discourse around Jefferson and more broadly, the conversation around slavery and racism evolve in profound ways. Both said Monticello had a responsibility to respond to and in many ways lead that change. One of the things that I've been trying to work with the guides to do, and I think successfully this has changed, Brandon said, is that we talk a great deal more about the transatlantic slave trade, how it is inextricably, I'm sorry, inextricably entwined with race, the development of that notion over time, and because of that, it helps us set up a conversation more for understanding race and what that means, which allows us to have more of this conversation on legacy. Generally, Monticello loses a significant amount of agency to the individual tour guides, almost all of whom are paid employees. The rigorous training process does not include tour scripts. Each guide writes a narrative draft that their manager reviews, and new guides shadow the tours of veteran guides. Even in recruiting, the education teams, the education teams attempt to get a sense of guides' ability to convey difficult, honest truths that force visitors to reckon with the brutality of the slave trade and also to understand that such a reckoning looks different based on each visitor's own set of experiences. So, if you have guests who come in and are like, I had no idea there was slavery, if you just come out and hit them over the head with it, they wouldn't listen, Linnea said. Although Monticello had been open to the public since the Thomas Jefferson Memorial Foundation purchased the property in 1923, the plantation to public wrestling with Jefferson's relationship to slavery began in 1993 as part of the foundation's Getting Word Oral History Project, in which the foundation interviewed the descendants of enslaved people from Monticello in an effort to preserve those histories. Their oral histories represented an attempt to get the descendants to share, his, to share stories their elders might have shared with them. The stories that arose from Getting Word became part of the tours Monticello created based on the lives of the enslaved populations there. This is how the word is passed down. 
remarked one of its descendants in an interview for the project. Not long after, in 1997, Annette Gordon-Reed published Thomas Jefferson and Sally Hemings, an American controversy. Gordon-Reed pushed back against centuries of claims suggesting that Jefferson had never had a sexual relationship with Hemings. It really goes to the histor historiogra historiography, Brandon said, and shows how Madison Hemings' words are really externally verifiable, and all the arguments against them are pretty easily refuted. The most detailed information we have about the relationship between Sally Hemings and Jefferson comes from Madison Hemings, their second surviving son, who gave an extended interview with the Pike County Republican newspaper editor, S.F. Wetmore, published on March 13, 1873. Most historians rejected these claims. Many of Jefferson's recognized descendants suggested instead that the Hemings children had been fathered by one or both of Jefferson's nephews, Peter and Samuel Carr, a theory originally propagated by two of Jefferson's grandchildren. Some historians also claimed that the Pike County Republican could not be trusted because, as historian Julian Boyd once noted, the publisher of the newspaper must surely have been a fanatical abolitionist, a blatant effort to dismiss Madison as a tool of abolitionist propaganda. As Gordon Reed puts it, the stereotype employed here is the feeble minds of black person as pawn to a white man, she goes on. One of the striking features of the writing about the Jefferson Hemings controversy is the easy manner with which historians make the black people in the story whatever they want or need them to be on the basis of no stated evidence. Gordon Reed cross-checked claims made at the time by both Madison Hemings and Israel Jefferson, another formerly enslaved person from Monticello. Against primary source evidence, she uncovered that Madison could not have been cognizant of at the time he made the claim. Additionally, Gordon Reed cross-checked the stories of the Hemings family against Jefferson's own records from Monticello. The result was a book that is now understood to have vindicated Madison Hemings' testimony and has made clear that historians long ignored compelling evidence of the relationship between Sally and Thomas. Then, in 1998, a DNA test ruled out the Carr brothers and established the father Sally Hemings' youngest child was a Jefferson. Researchers analyzed DNA samples from several people, including the descendants of Field Jefferson, who was Thomas Jefferson's paternal uncle. They also tested a man named John Weeks Jefferson, who was a descendant of Sally's son, Eston Hemings, and most importantly, the only available member of the Hemings family who was part of an unbroken line of male descendants, meaning that he would have had a direct Y chromosome match. At the time of the DNA test, researchers didn't think Madison or any of his male descendants were options. Even when the grave of Madison's son was found a couple of years later, his descendants didn't want to exhume the body. My family doesn't need to prove things, said Shea Banks Young, one of Madison Hemings' great-great-great-granddaughters. If they want to dig up Thomas Jefferson at the same time, maybe I'll reconsider. The combination of Gordon Reed's book and the DNA test forced the Thomas Jefferson Memorial Foundation, now named simply the Thomas Jefferson Foundation, which owns and operates Monticello, to re-examine its stance in Sally Hemings. After the DNA revelation, which received national attention and even an extended PBS program, the foundation began their own internal extent their own internal investigation. Two years later, they publicly confirmed that they believed Jefferson was indeed the father of Hemings' children. After their announcement, they began to say so on their tours. So, almost 20 years now, we've been saying on tours, every house tour, it's a rule that we say. We believe Jefferson was the father of Hemings' children. But in recent years, with the opening of the new exhibit, the equivocation is gone, Brandon said, his face becoming more sober. It's just Jefferson's the father of Hemings' children. Not everyone is a fan of the changes the Thomas Jefferson Foundation has made over the past two decades, and some Jefferson loyalists explicit, explicitly oppose the, the contemporary project of Monticello. For example, the Thomas Jefferson Heritage Society claims that, among other things, Monticello is misrepresenting the nature of Jefferson's relationship with Hemings. Vivian Kelly, vice president of the organization, has written the Thomas Jefferson Memorial Foundation is using Jefferson's Mont Monticello to make a political statement about the evils of slavery and seems to have taken things too far.
At the time of my visit, of the 89 tour guides, only four of them were black, and three of the four were a part of the incoming class that had yet to officially begin their jobs. Over the past dozen years, Brandon and Linnea told me there have been only about 10 in total. Both Brandon and Linnea admit that this is a place where Monticello falls short, but said that it is not for lack of effort. They point out a number of barriers, including the way black guides are treated by visitors. Many African American interpreters who have worked here, it's been challenging because people say some pretty insensitive and unbelievable things, said Brandon. Linnea told the story of a younger black woman guide who worked at Monticello for about two years and experienced a range of challenges, including harassment from visitors, people asking her on dates, and even people coming up and asking, oh, are you related to Sally Hemings? Another staff member was sitting in the cafe when a white woman who had just completed a tour came up from behind, hugged her, weeping, and said, I'm sorry for slavery. My tour guide, David, when I met him later, expressed his own surprise at the extent to which people respond differently to him than they do some of his counterparts. One of the things I have learned here at Monticello is that I have a certain style and name who I am, but there are colleagues of mine who are brilliant who have problems being taken seriously or who are spoken to by visitors in unpleasant ways because they're not old, because they're not an old white guy, because they're a 35 year old woman, he paused. But I'm almost embarrassed to say it today, but I never thought about that until I saw it happening to my colleagues. I thought of how this might extend beyond the guy at Monticello and to the visitors as well. What would motivate a black family to come spend the day at a plantation if they were concerned about how the story of that land would be told? What kind of people would be standing alongside them as it was told, and who was telling it? After I finished speaking with Brandon and Linnea, I made my way up to the top of the mountain where I met David for the Hemings family tour of Monticello. The tour I'd missed on my initial visit. The thunderstorm had just finished making its way across the mountain, and rivulets of rainwater slid down the roof of the replica cabin and drifted onto the ground. Just as he did during the Slavery Monticello tour, David did not mince words. There's a chapter in notes on the state of Virginia, he says to the five of us, standing in front of the East Wing of Jefferson's Manor. That has some of the most racist things you might ever read, written by anyone, anywhere, anytime in it. So sometimes I stop and ask myself, if Gettysburg had gone the wrong way, would people be quoting the Declaration of Independence or notes on the state of Virginia? It's the same guy writing. After the tour, David led me past the other tour groups into Jefferson's home, up a narrow stairwell onto the second floor and into a room with an empty table, three chairs, and misty windows overlooking the lawn. David sees it as essential that a guide be able to find the balance between telling the truth and not pushing people so much that they shut down. He told me that when you challenge people, specifically white people's conception of Jefferson, you're in fact challenging their conception of themselves. I've come to realize that there's a difference between history and nostalgia, and somewhere between two, those two is memory, he said. I think that history is the story of the past, using all the available facts, and that nostalgia is a fantasy of the past, using no facts, and somewhere in between is memory, which is kind of this blend of history and a little bit of emotion. I mean, History is kind of what you need to know, but nostalgia is what you want to hear. David knows that some visitors to Monticello arrive with an understanding of history that is not only misguided, but also harmful. He has a difficult time disentangling this from the current political moment. That's not the story of who we are, he said, referencing the language of Make America Great Again. But some people really, for whatever reason, they want to believe that they want to go back there, right? They want to go back to something that never existed. As David spoke, I thought about the tours I took during my first visit to Monticello. I had done the slavery and Monticello tour with David, but I had also participated in the main house tour, the one that nearly each person who buys a ticket to Monticello goes on. I took that tour after David's and was astonished by the difference. The house tour takes guests on a visit through Jefferson's home, explains the architecture, shares his family history, and outlines the role the house played in shaping Jefferson's life of ideas. Exploration and public service. What struck me 
was how little slavery was mentioned on this tour as compared to the one I had taken right before it. It is true that while Jefferson's life was always animated by slavery, it was not singularly tied to it. I understand there is much to be shared and explored about his life. It makes sense that people should know about the range of his scientific work, his political work, and his family life. I wonder, however, if we can understand any of these things without understanding Jefferson as a slave owner. Of the approximately 400,000 people who tour Monticello every year, only about 80,000, roughly a fifth, take the slavery of Monticello tour or participate in a program for students that uses content from slavery in Monticello. Before I left, I wanted to understand how much David's role as a former military officer responsible for protecting and promoting this country's foreign policy agenda at home and abroad was something that felt, if at all, in tension with his role now. I was born in the United States of America. I served the country for 30 years, so I actually believe in the idea of America, he said, straightening up in his chair. Are we exceptional? No. Have we had unique advantages based on geography, based on a whole lot, based on a whole host of factors? Yes. Did a group of people come together in 1776 and conceive of an idea that was pretty radical in its time and then create a system of government through the Constitution and its amendments that was pretty radical and pretty noble? Pretty novel? Yeah. Have other countries found their own way? Sure. So, I believe in the idea of America. I don't believe that this country was perfect. I don't believe it is perfect. I don't believe it's going to be perfect. I believe that the journey to make this a better place is worth the effort. And that the United States, if you conceive it, not so much as a place to be in, but an idea to believe in, it is worth fighting for. The office of Monticello's public historian is about half a mile down the road from the plantation and in a building that sits adjacent to the Jefferson Library. Naya Bates, then Monticello's director of African American history and director of the Getting Award Oral History Project, was at once erudite and wholly accessible. Her desk was covered in annotated books, some scattered, some stacked, but all examining the entanglement of slavery, Jefferson and Monticello. These are my Bibles, she said, as I picked each one up and flipped through its pages. As director of the Oral History Project, she has been responsible for engaging with the descendants of the enslaved community at Monticello. The project began in 1993, prior to the publication of Gordon Reed's book, The 250th Anniversary of Jefferson's Birth. Researchers traveled over 40,000 miles around the country, seeking out the families of descendants. At the time of our conversation, more than 200 people had been interviewed. Part of Naya's job is to cultivate and maintain relationships with the descendants. I'm looking for more surnames, she said. Jefferson owned 607 people. And so far, we've only identified 12 to 15 different surnames, which says a lot about the type of community that was here. A lot of these families are related to each other by marriage or unofficial marriage. I asked her how she goes about even beginning to look for these descendants, specifically for descendants of Jefferson and Hemings, in a country of more than 325 million people. She explained that her team uses both traditional, records-based genealogical tracing, and DNA tests. DNA test results to identify descendants of enslaved people, including those of Madison and Eston Hemings. Little is known about Beverly and Harriet Hemings, the two oldest children of Sally Hemings and Jefferson, who passed as white after leaving Monticello. Finding their descendants is far more challenging. It's tricky, she said, leaning back in her chair. Right now, our only way of doing that is DNA testing. We're hoping that as more people are getting tested, that someone will be able to pop up as a match. So just across Ancestry and 23 and Me, I asked, you're hoping that someone will pop up with a match to to other known Hemming descendants, she said, finishing my sentence, which would be a pretty phenomenal discovery. We've tried the paper trail method of looking them up and not, and have not been successful. We're not sure if they changed their names when they passed. We don't know what their married names would be, or at least for Harriet. For Beverly, we don't know anything. That trail went pretty cold quickly. We're hoping that through DNA research, we'll find some more people. She emphasized that her team isn't looking just for descendants of the Hemings family, but, but descendants of a number of other enslaved families who lived and worked at Monticello. Naya said 
They've also had people who claim to be descendants of enslaved families on Monticello reach out to them directly. When this happens, Monticello goes through a series of interviews to trace the person's lineage in order to determine the legitimacy of their claim. Another example, she said, is we had a family whose mother had passed, and very late in her life, she started revealing secrets about their family. They'd gone on a family trip to Buckingham County, which is the next county over, or south of here. They drove past the church, and their mom said, that's my home church, and they said, no, mom, that's the Hemings family church. And she was like, yeah, I know. So she was revealing sort of these secrets at the end of her life. We get a lot of people who are putting together pieces that way. In her capacity as public historian, Naya uses the information gathered from the oral history interviews, as well as her own research to inform the training for the guides, the exhibits, the website, and how Monticello publicly reckons with and talks about its relationship to this history. As much as Naya's work centers on histori historiograph historiography and research, her relationship to Monticello is not merely intellectual. It's personal. She grew up right down the road in Charlottesville, and as she told me, I don't remember a year why I didn't come to Monticello on a field trip. As she was growing up, her town was the center of the evolving debate around Thomas Jefferson's legacy, a debate that was happening both in the community and across the country. When she was around eight years old, she said, the Sally Hemings DNA results were released, and she remembered hearing people argue about them in the grocery store. I just remember being a kid and being like, who's Sally Hemings, and why is everybody so upset? I do remember the field trip I, I took after that, where we came here, and I asked about Sally Hemings, and the guide at the time told me, we don't talk about that. This unwillingness of people, particularly the guide to the plantation, to talk about something so relevant to the history of the town and the mountaintop plantation above it stayed with Naya for years. But it was when Naya was a junior at the University of Virginia that she realized reshaping public history was the work she wanted to do. She was enrolled in a class called Art and Culture of the Slave South, and as part of the course, they took field trips to local historical sites. One of these sites was a plantation called Cloverfields, a place Naya had driven past almost every day of her life, but had never actually visited. We walked around the asset of the plantation, and then we looked at all the outbuildings, and they were telling us about the people who built the buildings, the material culture of slavery, she said, leaning forward on the desk as she recalled the story. They're going on and on. Then we finally went into the big house. We came into the big house from the basement, and in the basement there was a kitchen. The whole class squeezed into this kitchen, and the woman who was leading the tour, who was a descendant of the owners of the plantation, reached behind her to close the door. When she closed the door, there were photographs of all the people who had worked at this plantation on the back of the door. I caught a glimpse of the door, and the first picture I saw was my grandma. I was like, oh my god, that's my grandma. Next to my grandmother was my aunt. There were other members of my family on that. And I started thinking about, like, I've always had an awareness that they worked at these places, but I hadn't connected it to this academic history of plantations. I was like, do people in my community know this is here? Are they aware of how they help shape this history that is often talked about without them? Naya soon learned that our family had been central to maintaining Cloverfields in the decades following emancipation. She'd had no idea. This led her to write her master's thesis on the historical district that Cloverfields was part of and its exclusion of post-emancipation black communities in historic preservation efforts. She discovered that in the early 20th centuries, I'm sorry, in the early 20th, 20th century, her grandfather had been a stonesmith, stonemason, her aunt had been a cook, and her grandmother had been a maid. This kind of started my path of thinking about public history, she said. That is, public history, historic districts, historic landmarks, the signs that people see along the road. How do I make sure that our history is part of it, or that my people are represented? She paused. Very literally, my people. Following the 2017 attack in Charlottesville and the rise in white nationalist terrorism over the past few years, Naya sees her work not just as an extension of her personal and intellectual commitments, but also as a political commitment. She thinks Monticello has an important role in helping people reckon with who they are in relation to this country's history. I think people come to us because they're grappling with their own identity, she said. And Monticello, in particular, is a place that is so intimately connected to who we are. 
or who we believe we are as Americans with freedom and democracy. Yet, it's also a place of bondage, and now people are really, really grappling with that question. I think it makes our work here that much more important, that we are able, maybe, to navigate people through the conversation. I told Naya that my experience on the Slavery and Monticello tour had been significantly different from my experience on the primary tour of Jefferson's home. We've been giving essentially the same main tour since the mid-50s. You go in through the front door, you walk in a circle, and then you come out the other side. That's the tour. There's some interesting history there too. In the first 30 years that Monticello was a museum, most of the guys were black, black men. They were dressed in livery. She paused because she must have been able to tell I wasn't familiar with the word. She leaned forward and spoke with the same measured conviction she had used throughout our conversation. They were dressed as enslaved people. I almost choked on my own tongue. I uncrossed my legs and sat back in my chair. For the first 30 years of its existence, I said, repeating what she had just told me so I could make sure I had heard correctly. Tours of the house were given by black men dressed as enslaved people? And I added, let me show you some pictures. She turned, her com she turned to her computer. In a sepia-toned photo taken in the 1930s or 1940s, two black men stood in front of Monticello's west-facing portico columns with the entrance open behind them. They each wore three-piece tuxedo suits with two rows of buttons ornamenting their outer jackets. They each had thin bow ties and striped vests underneath. They looked toward the camera with expressions difficult to interpret. Some of them were descendants of people who were enslaved here, Naya said. Sometimes the stories the men told about the plantation had been passed on to them by family members. While losing myself in the photo, it was easy to forget that this was not actually a photograph of two enslaved people, but people tasked with playing a role of enslaved people. In memoirs of, Monticello hostess, of a Monticello hostess, Terry Tillman, who worked as a hostess in the 1940s and 1950s and who became Monticello's head tour guide, writes, the transition from colored guides to white hostesses in 1951 was not too well received. Visitors resented our becoming more factual and less entertaining. It's like you're gone with the wind plantation story, Naya said. I mentioned my conversation with Grace and Donna. They came here, they bought a ticket, made a reservation, got on a plane, rented a car, self-identified as history buffs, and showed up and were like, I had no idea that Jefferson owned slaves. I said, and it was such a fascinating moment for me because I'm like, you're clearly not an uncurious person. You literally said I'm a history buff. I wanted to come see where Jefferson lived. I wanted to see Jefferson's house, but had no conception of who he really was, right? Naya said, not just who he was, I said, but even that Monticello was a plantation. Naya nodded. So many people come here with an understanding of the primary cause of the Civil War. Some people think Jefferson wrote the Constitution. I mean, there are just so many ways that our public education is failing people, but just not giving them the context to understand that Monticello was a plantation and that slavery was a system that created the economic prosperity that enabled our country to exist. That is not something most people understand. I don't really blame them because they're not taught to engage that history. And most people are not out here reading all these books that are piled on my desk. She continued. So we try to be very gentle. We try to give people a number of disclaimers like, what you're going to hear today might be difficult. This may be the first time you've thought about it since the seventh grade, and that's okay. You're gonna have a lot of questions. No question is a stupid question. We just try to make it as easy as possible, acknowledging the fact that those women may have been here on vacation, that many people are stopping here after they stopped at a vineyard, that they're bringing their kids who are curious and doing a unit on slavery at school but are otherwise not engaged in the visit at all. There are just so many different reasons that people come to these places that we try not to judge them based on their understanding, especially being the only American plantation on the UNESCO, U-N-E-S-C-O, World Heritage, World Heritage List. There are a number of international visitors that actually have no understanding of American slavery or the transatlantic slave trade. So we just get so many people with no background. Naya added, however, that she has zero patience for those who, when confronted with that history, contend that Monticello is attempting to tear down Jefferson's legacy. 
It's telling the full truth of who he was, she said. Yes, he contributed great things. Yes, he gave us the Declaration of Independence and the university where I got my degree. But he also owned people. He owned ancestors of people I know. That's reality. I think in order to really understand him and to fully understand him, you have to grapple with slavery. You have to grapple with physical violence and psychological violence and family separation. We would not be doing the hist we would not be doing the story justice if we don't tell those stories. To get to Jefferson's grave, you walk for about a third of a mile along a winding uphill path. The gravel, a thin membrane scattered atop, the red clay of this Virginia mountainside crunches under your feet with each step. As you walk along the serpentine path to the cemetery, bending branches and thick pockets of leaves provide shadowy res respite from the midsummer heat. Splashes of light sneak between the leaves and onto the ground, the three branches reaching up to slice open the sky. Lining the Auburn Road leading up to the graveyard are rows of golden willow trees that sit among white oaks. In the Monticello graveyard, Jefferson is buried alongside his descendants. At the center of the graveyard sits a large tulip pup poplar tree, its thick trunk a discolored medley of browns. The grave site, its iron gates, majestic tombstones, and gold ornamentation, stands in stark contrast to the grave site farther down the hill where over 40 of Jefferson, Thomas Jefferson's enslaved workers are buried. That space is enclosed by wooden fencing that has weathered over time. Dual emerald moss grows along much of the unevenly cut timber. The ground is an unremarkable coalescence of soil and wood chips and indiscriminate patches of foliage dotting the graveyard with small streaks of green, while the Jefferson Cemetery is filled with tombstones, heralding the names of roughly 200 Jefferson's descendants and their spouses. The burial ground of the enslaved has no ornamentation or personal designation. There are a few scattered headstones, though no visible names or inscriptions. The trees around the graves hold court of a congregation of unmarked ruins. No one knows the names of the people buried here. In the hours just before Jefferson died, when no one else could understand his mumbled near lifeless words, it was another of his enslaved attendants who, knowing that he was asking to have his pillow repositioned, raised Jefferson's head. Only a short time after, Jefferson passed away. Throughout his life, Jefferson valued the company of cosmopolitan guests the time to read and write and think, the elegance of fine architecture, the flavor of savory food and the fragrance of the natural world, a life in which he could nurture his mind and satisfy his tastes. This life was only possible because of the enslaved men and women he held, sold, and separated, because of the people he allowed to be threatened, manipulated, flogged, assaulted, deceived, and terrorized. Jefferson's vacillation from moral repugnance to hollow justification reflects how he largely succumbed to that which he knew was indefensible. He still held hostage the men and women and children enslaved on his plantation. He still separated them. He still refused to provide freedom to more than a handful of people. But Monticello is not singularly defined by Jefferson. It could not have existed without the enslaved people who lived there, who had families there, who built a community there that spanned generations. As a public servant, Jefferson spent more than half his life away from his plantation, while many of the hundreds of people enslaved at Monticello stayed on that land for the entirety of their lives. As much as this land illuminates the contradictions of Jefferson's legacy, it also serves as a reminder of the hundreds of black people who made a home there. Their lives are also worthy of remembrance and commemoration. One of the last things David said before I left my second tour at Monticello spoke to this duality. duality. You're here. Sally's brother James Hemings got be here. Not in a book, right? Right here is where that happened. When 100 enslaved people at Monticello were auctioned after Jefferson's death, it was right there in the West Lawn behind us, David continued. It happened right there. And Jefferson's ideas about the Declaration of Independence, even though he wrote the document in Philadelphia, his whole idea of where he was going was formulated right here on this mountaintop. All right, thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. I know it was a longer one, but this really covered a lot of important information. I really hope 
that you followed along. Um, the next chapter will be on the Whitney Plantation. I hope to see you there again. Thank you so much for watching, listening, and reading along. Bye! Thank you.